Good morning. Bow your heads with me, please. Lord, thank you for this opportunity on this beautiful day in July to be in your house, to be with the people that we love and care for, but most of all, Lord, to be with you, to listen to the word, the messages, and the prayers that are offered today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Let's stand and sing The Way of the Cross Leads Home, page 490. friends and neighbors. Glad you could be here this morning. Beautiful day. We have some announcements in our bulletin. 
Under the calendar of events, we have Tuesday Bible study at church at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesday Bible study at 7. And Monday morning, tomorrow, we have an organization meeting for the rummage and bake sale. So if you can come to that, help us price things and try to organize things. We've got a lot of things back there. I've already been shopping. <laughs> Ron says he's going to just turn his head when I walk in the door so you won't see what I brought home. <laughs> and the rummage and bake sale will be on Friday and Saturday, July 29th and 30th. Does anyone else have a, an announcement? Good morning again. Scripture this morning from Psalm, one simple but powerful verse, and then I'll have a short devotion that goes along with it. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. May God adds blessing to the reading of the word. Many times throughout our, our service, Ron has some history background with some of the hymns, uh, which I find very interesting. I mean, for years and years and years of sung, we've sung the old hymns and uh, never really realized, you know, the source of, uh, of where these came from. So this one today uh, from this verse comes uh, with a, uh, about a, a man by the name of Joseph Scriven. Um, and it just simply talks about his life and his tragedy and, and what led him to, read, uh, to, to write this song that we've all sang many, many times. It says, a young Irishman, Joseph Scriven, who was born in 1820 and passed away in 1886, he was deeply in love with a young woman and their, their marriage plans had been made. The night before their wedding, however, she drowned in a tragic accident. For months, Scriven was bitter and in utter despair. At last he turned to Christ and through his grace found peace and comfort. Out of this experience, Scriven wrote the familiar hymn that has brought consolation to millions of aching hearts. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. Sometimes our ways lie in the sunlight. It was so for Joseph Scriven as he approached his wedding day but like him, we find that our path also leads through the dark shadows of loss, disappointment, and sorrow. Yet even sorrows turn to blessings when they make us less attached to the earth and more attached to God. Then more than ever, we discover that Jesus truly is our friend, all our sins and griefs to bear. Our communion hymn is 482, Grace That Is Greater Than Our Sin, verses 1 and 4.
As we prepare for communion this morning, I'd like to share a communion meditation devotion. I know that many of us are fans of Charles Stanley. I know many of us sometimes uh, in the morning before we come to church will watch uh, and listen to one of his messages. So anyway, this communion meditation comes from a devotion that is full of Charles Stanley's work. I'll be reading uh, from Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It says, God, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive again together with Christ. The Lord Jesus, God incarnate, chose to endure the cross for us. Think about that truth. Crucifixion was the most horrible way a person could die. Humiliating, horrifically painful, and reserved for the worst offenders. But realize it wasn't only earthly anguish that Jesus experienced on the cross. He also felt the unbearable spiritual agony of bearing the sins of this world. For the first time in eternity, he understood the profound hopelessness of being separated from the Father. Why would Jesus make such a sacrifice? Because that's how deeply he loves us. He preferred to suffer an excruciating death among the worst criminals rather than be separated from us. So the next time that we feel unworthy or unlovable, remember what your Savior endured to save you and keep you safe for all eternity. He laid down his life willingly for all of us, and even now he holds nothing back so that we can know him. Surely that's reason for us to praise his name. Let's pray. Jesus, I am humbled at all that you sacrificed for me and for all of us. Truly, you are worthy of my love, obedience, and praise. And Father, as we stand before this communion table this morning, as we prepare to take this bread, which symbolizes your broken body, and drink from the cup, which symbolizes the blood that you shed on that cross, we just bring honor and glory and just so grateful, Father, for your love and your mercy and your grace. It's in Jesus Christ's precious name that I pray. Amen. Thank you. We read in Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat, for this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Shall we pray together? Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to be here together. Thankful, Father, for the beauty of this season of the year. The Corn Father is already taller than most of us. Grateful, Father, for the rains this past week. And pray, Father, that you would be with each farmer and watch over them and on all of those who give them service at this time of year. We're thankful, Father, for the privilege of coming together. We know, Father, for many of us, we grew up with a big family meal at... Uh, noon on Sunday, and we uh, had uh, friends and family over. And then, Father, I remember uh, Jeanette and I in our early years, almost always we had people over from church. And so, Father, that was always a special time that we remember. As we look around this morning, Father, we remember a father, a mother, a friend, an uncle, a brother, or a sister, who sat in these pews. We just pray, Father, that as we partake of this time together, that we would remember them, 
But above all those memories, we might remember what happened for us and to us at Calvary. That this Jesus who knew no sin, this Jesus took upon himself our sin. And if we believe in him, Father, we will have resurrected life, we will have eternal life, and we will have what he calls in John 10 is a good life in the here and the now. We're thankful, Father, that he was resurrected and ascended. And right now, as we think of all the needs in our lives and all the praises we have, he is sitting at your right hand making intercession. Be near us, Father, and we will give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Please you stand? If you have your Bibles, turn with me at Matthew. We're looking at chapter 9, and then following our reading, Sonny will have our special music. Matthew 9, we continue our study of the apostles, and uh, his picture is on our communion table. This is Matthew. Look at Matthew 9, beginning at verse 9. Jesus went on from there and saw a man named Matthew, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Well, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And then look at the beginning of verse 13 again. Go and learn what this means. May God add his blessing to his reading of his word.
All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sonny. Shall we pray? Father, we're thankful for the beautiful medley that uh, Sonny played. Thankful, Father, that it's a perfect mood setter for the life of uh, Matthew. Pray, Father, that as we study his life, we might see what he did well and also his imperfections. We pray, Father, we might find a bit of Matthew in ourselves and in the same way that he was lifted up by our Lord, we pray that you would lift us up in this hour. Speak to us, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. I grew up learning about the presidents. When I was uh, about six years old, uh, I got a uh, coloring book with all the presidents of the United States. And one of the more fascinating ones to me is Calvin Coolidge. He was president in the uh, 1920s. And uh, oddly enough, he was president, and yet he was a man of few words. He was a believer, and so he went to church every Sunday. And most of the time, his wife was with him. But one Sunday in particular, she was not well, and he went to church by himself. Well, when he got home, she wanted to know what the preacher talked about. And his short answer was, sin. Well, she said, come on, Calvin. What in the world did he say about sin? What was the passage? What were his illustrations? What was it all about sin? And Coolidge thought for a minute, and then he said, he's again it. He's again it. <laughs> well, the guy we look at today, Matthew, gradually became against sin. When I read that, I always think of my father-in-law. Uh, Jeanette's dad uh, knew me as a teenager and then a school teacher and later as a minister. And uh, every week he would ask me, what in the world are you going to preach about? And I would always say, sin. And he would always say, you covered that. Try something else. And we had that back and forth until he died in 1981. Well, Matthew is a trip, okay? If you read in Matthew here, he calls himself Matthew, but if you read elsewhere, he's often called Levi. And he's really just a thief and a traitor, okay? Frank Mead said he was a thief who became a minister, and he was a pygmy man of character who became a colossal saint. This gospel is called the Galilean gospel. And uh, it's the only one to really talk about the kingdom parables. Remember in Matthew 1, he really talks about the entire Old Testament and puts all of that together. And then he's the one who will write an entire gospel for the Jews summarizing the Old Testament. And money? He will mention money more than any other writer, and he'll always mention big sums of money, like a talent, or gold, or silver, or brass. Well, William Barclay calls him an unlikely candidate for the office of an apostle. Turn with me again to verse 9. As Jesus went on, from there, and this was his own town, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Most writers at that time, and most of the commentators believe, Jesus had probably been in Matthew's booth. Remember, Jesus would go with his mother, and until he was 30, he made a living as a carpenter. And so he probably paid his tax and his mother tax, and maybe even watched O Matthew grow. The Living Bible says, come and be my disciple. And it says Matthew jumped up and went along with him. The Amplified just says, 
come to my side, be with my party, and follow me. And when he says that, he's recognizing how difficult that would be for Matthew. Matthew was a hated character. He was Jewish, and, uh, and yet he was a tax collector. Well, because he was Jewish, the uh, Roman officials really didn't like him, really didn't trust him very much. And then because he was a tax collector, his own people hated him. You remember how it was, the emperor would say, Sonny, you have to pay a certain tax, and maybe it's $5. Well, then the politician under him would levy that tax and it would be up to 10. And then the politician would be un under him would up it again and instead of five or 10, it's 15. Well, by the time you got to Matthew, he had to skim off the top to get his cut. And so you grew up knowing that and you really despised the tax collector. And yet Jesus comes to call this sinner to repentance. He was a publican, and a publican was looked upon as a leech. There's a Jewish proverb of that time that said, take not your wife from a publican or a tax collector, for they're thieves, they're robbers, and they're wicked sinners. Well, that covers it pretty well, not much good said about them. Now drop down to verse 10. Here we move from his call to a celebration, and this seems odd. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors, many sinners, came and ate with him and his disciples. The Phillips translation calls them disreputable people, the Amplified calls them wicked sinners. The Living Bible calls them notorious swindlers. I mean, nobody has got a good word for them. And yet, right after he's called, there's this great big celebration, a great big dinner at his house. And he evidently knew the people that he invited, and he wanted them to know about Jesus. I thought of that this week. Jeanette and I like to ride our bikes to Bev's. How many of you have been to Bev's restaurant on 25th Street? It's a, a neat place. We love to ride over there and eat and then ride home. And while we're there, there was a fellow I did not know. I thought his wife looked familiar, but I did not know him. And he said, Mr., are you so-and-so? Well, I was not so-and-so. I went over and we began to talk to one another. And we talked and I learned that he was a veteran, got called into the uh, Gulf War when he was 55 years of age. He's now 85. I said, where do you live? He said, oh, I live off Fruit Ridge and uh, Holman. I said, what's your street number? He said, it's Trey. I live at... Uh, 39, 40, or 59, Trey Drive. He said, where do you live? I said, I live at 39, 49, Trey Drive. They haven't been there very long, and yet while they've been there, he's not been well, and he's not been out, and here we are living right there together, putting our trash cans out and all the rest, and I didn't even know him. Well, Matthew knows these people. And even though they're disreputable and they're wicked and they're notorious, he invites them to meet Jesus and to have a great big meal. A couple of the writers said he was doing a lot of things with that meal. People did amazing things with their meal. Many people think he was commemorating his new life. Others think he was offering a farewell dinner to his old friends. And then most agree it was a public confession of his surrender to Jesus Christ. Psalm 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Matthew did. And he invited his friends. He knew them. 
they're probably a fairly close-knit group because nobody liked them, and so they tended to go as a flock of the same feathers. Earlier we sang Jesse Pounds the Way of the Cross Leads Home, and there's that wonderful chorus, The Way of the Cross Leads Home, and then as if we didn't get it, The Way of the Cross Leads Home, It's sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Matthew found that. Remember later on in Luke, Jesus will call a man by the name of Zacchaeus, who was a tax man. He'll call him. But it upsets everybody when he calls him here. So drop down to verse 11. Sometimes you and I are in verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? You ever been in church when someone went forward and they were kind of a pagan person and you could hear people gasp? Well, that would have been the way they were. Remember, they were schooled in the letter of the law. And if you deviated from one of those 600 laws, then somehow you were in the wrong. I love the Message Bible. It says, when the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit. And they led into Jesus and his followers. What kind of example is this from your teacher? He's being cozy with crooks and riffraff. Crooks and riffraff. Some of us were crooks and riffraff before we came to know Christ. Tony Evans, when he writes about this, says, the Pharisees saw Jesus fraternizing with the enemy. I've often talked about a man named Ron Firno in Kokomo, Indiana. When we went there for Sunday there in uh, February of 1975, he walked the aisle and we could hear people gasp. Well, he had been a druggie and he had been an alcoholic and a womanizer and all of that. And I remember God really began to grow him while we were there. And in the process, they became children youth leaders but there are a few people who weren't sure they ought to send their children there because they knew his past, but not his present and his future. The Pharisees knew Matthew's past. They didn't know his present, and they didn't know his future. Look at verse 12. This is Jesus' defense in all of this. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. It's not the healthy, but it's the sick. Some of the neatest worship services I was ever a part of was in the Carlisle prison shortly after it opened. Um, Admittedly then there was only one unit, as I recall. And we were in uh, Sullivan at the First Baptist Church, and we would go there every uh, three months. But seeing God working in their lives, we didn't need to know what they had done to get there. But God was doing something. And the service was structured in such a way that you saw the gifts of even the people incarcerated there. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. If we're honest, when we came to Christ, were we spiritually healthy or were we sick? I saw it immediately in my dad. My dad would sometimes become uh, upset with something and he would send me into the house because he didn't want me to hear what he was saying. But when he came to know the Lord and after he was baptized, he was different. He didn't talk that way anymore. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. The Phillips Bible says, 
It's not the fit and the flourishing who need the doctor, but those who are ill. How many of you know someone who is ill? We all do. And they need to be here or they need to be somewhere. They need to see and hear the gospel. The Message Bible puts it another way. The Message Bible says, Jesus speaking, I'm here to invite outsiders, not to coddle the insiders. I'm after mercy, not religion. Never will forget when we were in Kokomo, we dealt with a young man who came to know Christ who had never gone to church in his life. And uh, Albert was really growing. He came to know Jesus. And we went on a retreat, and I asked him to help serve communion. Boy, I heard about that. That got all the way from northern Indiana back to Kokomo. Because somehow he hadn't had the training. And he wasn't as good as so-and-so. Well, I knew so-and-so, and not all of them were like they should have been. You ever know people like that? I'm here to invite the outsiders, not to coddle the insiders. Tony Evans on this passage writes, After all, Jesus was on a rescue mission. I would just offer that if we all took this seriously and became invitational toward people that were around, that we live near or that we work with or that we see at this place or that place, we could become more inviting and more loving to them. And maybe they would see Jesus in us and then we would reach a point we could invite them to church. Invite them to the yard sale. Okay, invite them there and then, uh, you know, behave like a believer at the yard sale. <laughs> I've heard all kinds of stories about yard sales this week. Oh, my. In my house, we've not been fortunate at yard sales. And so every time somebody brings it up, I go and get $100 and give them if you won't have one. We haven't been helpful. Hopefully we're going to do real well at the yard sale. I want you to drop down to verse 13 and see the challenge that I think is there for us. And then he said, go, learn. I love that. Jesus telling us to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Go and learn what it means. When I was in college, I had to take Dr. Bash for some kind of an English literature class, and it was in the summer. Have any of you ever taken an English lit class in the summer? Oh, that is a mistake. Well, you do okay with all your readings until about the middle of the second week. And then I remember 7.30 in the morning, he came in. We opened our books, and he would uh, spitfire questions at you at 7.30 in the morning. Bing, bing, bing. And it was obvious not one person there had read it. And I'll never forget at 7.40, looking at the clock, he closed his book, and that book was thick, and it made a big noise, and he said, well, I won't say what he said, but he said, come in tomorrow, and you better know it. Well, we got it. We might have goofed off in another class, but we had him. He basically said, go, learn, and that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, get over it. Don't look at where they come from. But I came, what? To invite in the outsiders and not coddle the insiders. Not get the fit and the flourishing, but those who need a doctor. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. That phrase, go and learn, it's found in Hosea in chapter 6. It's found in 1 Samuel in chapter 15. And it's found in Micah in chapter 6. Go, learn. 
That'd be a good call for us today. Frank Mead writes, Matthew sold himself two different times. The first time he sold himself to mammon, and the second time he sold himself to God. He left his thievery behind. He exchanged his publican wretchedness for apostolic dignity, and he deserted his wealth and mammon for Christ and his odyssey. He probably wrote this gospel in about 70 AD, about 35 years after Jesus left this earth, but he wanted the Jews that he knew so well to have it. We sang Julia Johnston's grace that is greater than all our sin, and I love that. Look at that chorus again. Grace, grace, God's grace. And what is grace? It's an acrostic. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. In other words, I didn't do anything to earn it. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Matthew got pardoned, and then he got cleansed, and then he began to invite people to Jesus, and he became a missionary other places. And then the chorus says, grace that is greater than than all our sin. His grace is greater than my sin, all of our sin together, all of those who have ever lived, all of those who live now, all of those who will ever all live. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Matthew experienced that kind of grace and he wanted to pass it on to people around him. My mentor was Willie Lucas. At 85, he, he still preaches in California. And uh, we went into the ministry under him at Kokomo, and when I was a kid in high school, he was my pastor. And he would preach on this, and he would tell the story of his father. His father was a real character. His father was a mechanic in Terre Haute on Poplar Avenue ran a mechanic place where they now make champagne velvet beer again. <laughs> and Willie said I would go there and tape my ears shut because it was awful. But he said someone introduced Jesus to my dad. And you know it happened to be a fellow who was the uh, manager of, uh, not the man, he, he, he actually was the uh, uh, treasurer for the Terre Haute Phillies. This is really going back a long way. They were in Terre Haute many, many years ago in the 1940s and the early 50s. And a fellow named Beer, Bill led him to the Lord. Well, what he did then was the same thing that Matthew did. He began sharing Christ with people that he knew. And so for him, he would go down to the jail early on Sunday morning to find out which ones of his friends were in there because of a night of drinking and debauchery. And then of all things, he would uh, say, if you'll go to church with me, I'll buy you any meal you want. And he would take them down the center aisle of the First Baptist Church in Terre Haute. In those days, the ushers would wear black suits with tails and boutonnieres, and they were upset by all of that. But he continued to do it, continued to do it, because he was sharing Christ with those who were sick. Oh, how many of us have trash? Monday night, we get our trash together, and then uh, I put it out Monday night because sometimes they come real early, and I want to make sure it's out there on the street. I guess I could leave it where it is for one week and probably get by with it. Might get by with it for two weeks, 
at the end of the second week, I'd be looking for a new home, okay? We don't do that. Why do we want to get rid of our trash? It's not healthy. It's not good. It's all that we have thrown away and discarded. But some of us try to hang on to their sin in our lives. Have Jesus, but still hang on to that trash because we somehow feel responsible for it. But Jesus came to give us life, and he said abundant life. And in the giving, what do we do with our trash? We heap it upon him on Calvary's tree. Jesus says, go. He says, learn. In other words, you don't have to carry that burden with you anymore. I pastored a fellow in Shelbyville and also in Kokomo, and uh, he was carrying around all of his burdens. Had another lady in the church in uh, Shelbyville, she'd come forward and walk the aisle every other week. She would not give up this trash. We need to give it to the Lord and he takes care of it. And then, like Matthew, we can be brand new. We can be different. Go and learn. I'm told downtown in St. Louis, there is a very old railroad station. And that is a station where there are all of these roads that intersect and they come together. And one of them is a, like a thin handle bar. And if it goes this way, one train will change tracks and go that way. And if it goes the other way, <laughs> the train will change tracks and go that way. One will go to San Francisco and one will go to New York City. And it's all right there in that little lever but it depends on which one you set, which one direction you want to go. Matthew was going one direction. As Paul would say, he was going in this direction. As John would say in John 3 to Nicodemus, you need to be transformed, you need to change your direction. And he completely went the other direction for the rest of his life. Sometimes we get back on another track, but we can always come to Jesus because he told us to go and to learn. You may be at that point today. Maybe you've never accepted Christ, and so you need to come and walk the aisle and make him your savior. Or it may be he's your savior, but you're still hanging on to the trash, to the sin back here, and he's wanting to take all of that from us. And so we need to come, because he says, go, and he says, learn. And the language there is simple. It means from here till the end of our time. Go and learn. Shall we pray? Oh, Father, I'm thankful for the example of Matthew. A lot of us are Matthew types, Father. Some of us are on the right track today, but we can sure remember when we weren't. Or some of us get sidetracked to a different track. And we need to hear the words of Jesus to go and to learn. I pray, Father, for whatever it is you're saying to us today that we might respond. Maybe there's someone here, Father, who has never accepted Jesus as Savior. They might come. Maybe, Father, there's someone here who wants to unite with the church. We pray they might come. Or maybe, Father, you're speaking to some of us who long ago made our commitment to Christ. But right now, he's not Lord of our existence. Help us to come, Father, and to hear, go, and learn. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Number 470 is our great hymn with the question, where could I go? We're going to do verses one and three. Will you stand with me and respond as God would lead? Where could I go? be seated as we look at our prayer request. On the back of your bulletin, you'll see Karen Vinsel's name at the top under our missionaries. We received a letter from her this week, as many of you may have. She had COVID uh, the second time, but she said it only lasted for a day, but it kept her from going on a trip she had planned. And she said it was a good thing because her mother contracted it and she needed to stay home and take care of her mother. And she's also waiting for sinus surgery, which has been postponed. Um, under sympathy, we have the family of Bob Myers, who was a friend of the Cullisons. And um, our friend Mike Hughes died yesterday morning after his battle with his lung and kidney disease. Um, it was really a blessing that the day before he died, um, a group from hospice VNA came and had a little ceremony for him, thanking him for being a veteran, and it was very nice. Several of you have mentioned that you've seen that service too. So that was a real blessing for him, and he really made him happy. And also the night before he died, he got to see his two of his sons um, perform in a, a, a I'm sorry. <laughs> Help me, Ronnie. <laughs> the, um, they were, they were in the <laughs> Barber Shoppers. <laughs> Their quartet had won the world championship a few years ago, and they were invited to the Charlotte, uh, North Carolina uh, celebration of bar Barber Shoppers this year and he got to see them on the computer, on, on the Zoom, the night before he died. <clears throat> um, let's see. Bill Rimmel will have a heart cath on Wednesday. We need to pray for him in safety. And for Sonny as she waits for that. Um, we have a praise from Tom Cullison. He has received a report that there is no sign of cancer. So we're real happy for that. And Carol has her boot off, so she's, her foot is still sore on her ankle, but she doesn't have to wear the boot all the time now. Are there other prayer requests or praises? Daddy.
Okay, so Courtney has antibiotics for an infection from a stitch from her surgery, and Jack has COVID, but has medicine for that. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please stand if you're able. Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thankful, Father, for the privilege of worshiping you in this hour, and grateful, Father, for all of those who made it possible. Thankful, Father, for Sani and her beautiful number that she did, and for those who shared prayers or shared devotionals, or even, Father, those who shook our hand at the outset to make us feel welcome. As we take our leave, Father, we remember others. Remember Mel, Father. Report is he's driving again, and we know how important that was to Mel. Thankful, Father, for your healing touch. Thank you that Betty is back with us. Thankful, Father, for Dorothy. Pray that many of us might continue to visit Dorothy and bring the outside world to her. We remember a Diane, Father, so thankful that she is able to come to church. Thankful, Father, that Rhea Anthony was better this week and able to go out with her friends. Remember Bill and Sonny, Father, on Wednesday afternoon. Thankful, Father, that Carol has a boot off. And we remember Jim's Carol and pray for your healing, Father, through her oral surgery. We remember, Father, others who are on a list Remember Father Karen Vinsel, thankful for all that she does for the cause of Christ with your word. Remember uh, Mary Lou Welch and her two boys, Robbie and Lee, who have both been ill. Remember Jack, Father. And Father, we remember all of those who have lost loved ones. The Myers family was mentioned, and of course, the Hughes family. We know, Father, that one boy drove home yesterday all the way from North Carolina and uh, so he could be with his mother. And the two other brothers will be flying home as we speak. And just pray, Father, for traveling mercies for all of them. Pray, Father, for loved ones who are traveling. No, Mary Jane has a family in Alaska just now. And pray, Father, for all of our unspoken requests. Sometimes, Father, we look at our list and it seems inexhaustible. And then, Father, we remember the ability you have to meet every need. And so we're thankful for your inexhaustible supply, the way that you give us love and grace and mercy. Now go with us, Father, as we make our leave. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing our closing.